Hi, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville, coming to you now on the Wednesday of the fifth week of Lent. We are getting very close to Passion Week here, and the readings are getting more intense. So in the first readings, we are seeing examples from the Old Testament of types of our Lord's Passion, and that is no exception Uh, On this Wednesday, when we read uh, in Daniel 3 for our first reading about the three young men in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as VeggieTales famously uh, spoofed it, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Uh, So these young men are in this furnace because of their testimony to their Jewish faith at the time and their refusal to commit idolatry and as they are thrown into the fiery furnace a fourth man appears in the furnace with them who looks like the son of god and the church fathers understood that to be the pre-incarnate christ uh, that is to say the second person of the trinity um, appearing to them in some form uh, to console them Uh, and also to save them from the the flames of martyrdom. And so these young men were willing to go to their death. Uh, They proclaimed their faith to Nebuchadnezzar that their God could save them if he wished, but even if their God did not save them, they would not bow down and worship an idol. Um, As it turned out, God did save them, although they were willing to die for the sake of their religion, their faith, and their relationship with God. And so they are one of several types of the passion in the Old Testament where individuals uh, prefigured the suffering of our Lord by being willing to die for fidelity to the covenant with the Lord God of Israel. And uh, some did die, but others were miraculously saved, which is a premonition of the resurrection. And so that's what we have going on in our first reading. And then in our gospel reading for today, we have a darkly humorous passage from John 8, where our Lord is in a debate with the Pharisees. And um, the Pharisees and the Jews that support the Pharisees, uh, unfortunately, uh, keep sticking their foot in their mouth and saying things that are awkward and are actually technically not true based on salvation history. And if you know salvation history, you can see how weak their accusations against Jesus are and how weak their defense of their own position is. And again, there it's, it's humorous, or at least it would be humorous if it were not so intense and if it were not so lethal. So let me uh, read a bit and explain what I mean. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered, we are the descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Okay, let's just stop a minute. We just usually, you know, let the biblical text go in one ear and out the other without thinking critically about what's taking place here. But they've just said, we are the descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Is that true? Um, no. First of all, they were enslaved most famously for 400 years by the Egyptians. And you know how their origin as a nation was like this thing called the Exodus where they got out of slavery. And that was after Abraham. Remember, Abraham is is maybe around the turn of the second millennium BC and Moses is uh, uh, centuries later, maybe the middle of the second century uh, BC. 
So there's a huge elapse of time during which, during most of which time, they are enslaved to the Egyptians. All right. Then Moses sets them free. They go out to Sinai. They enter the Promised Land under Joshua. They have a few generations of freedom. And then, if you read the Book of Judges, they are enslaved in turn by all kinds of foreign oppressors: the Midianites, the Moabites, the Canaanites,、uh, the Arameans. One group after another oppresses them. The Philistines, for example, and different judges have to rise up to reestablish their freedom from the oppression that they receive. Then David and Solomon lead them in a, a golden era, but after that golden era is over, they are subjugated by the Egyptians under Rehoboam,、uh, Solomon's heir. And then at different times in their history during the Reign of the kings, they are vassal kingdoms, that is, subjugated kingdoms to different world powers, either the Egyptians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians. Then the Assyrians come in, destroy the northern ten tribes, and enslave all of them and drag them off into exile.、Uh, 150 years later, the Babylonians come in, defeat the kingdom of Judah, enslave all of them, and drag them off to exile for. Fifty to seventy years, depending on how you calculate that. Then they're finally allowed to go back by the Persians, but the Persians remain their overlords, and they are a tiny vassal kingdom under the Persian Empire for a while. Then the Greeks come in and subjugate them, and they're subjugated to the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt or the Seleucid Empire in um, uh, Syria. For、uh, centuries, until finally the Maccabees give them a brief period of freedom before the Romans subjugate them. And as they are speaking here to Jesus, they are currently subjugated by the Romans. And whenever the Romans feel like it, the Romans just treat them like slaves. So if the Romans get mad, they crucify Jews. Crucifixion is a very common punishment imposed on the Jews, and it was the punishment. That Romans themselves only inflicted on their own slaves, not on freeborn Roman citizens. So, in so many ways, they were the slaves of the Romans, as they're speaking to Jesus. So they say this very ironic statement: "We are the descendants of Abraham, never been enslaved to anyone." It's more like we're the descendants of Abraham, and we've been enslaved to everyone. To what major ethnic group have we not been made subservient at some time in our history? But Jesus isn't even talking about that kind of、uh, slavery. He says, "Amen, amen. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin." He's talking about slavery to sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son always remains. So, if the son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know you are the descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no room among you. I tell you that I've what I've seen in the Father's presence. Then do what you have heard from the Father. They answered him and said, "Our father is Abraham." Jesus said to them, "If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father." Then they said, "We are not born of fornication. We have one father, God." Let's just take that statement. We are not born of fornication. All right, fornication is any kind of、uh, physical union between. Man and woman outside of legitimate marriage.、Uh, broadly speaking,、uh, that's that's what the term meant、uh, for the ancient、uh, Jews. It's zone, an illegitimate union, a non-marital union. So we are not born of fornication. Why don't we actually go back to the book of Genesis and find out the origins of the tribe of Judah? Because these are Judeans who are arguing with Jesus, and Judean comes from Judah. The tribe to which they belonged, and that's also the origin of the term Jew. So let's go back to the origins of the tribe of Judah, which is found in Genesis 38. And there, in Genesis chapter 38, we find that almost all of Judah's descendants come from an illicit union that Judah himself had with his daughter-in-law, who was masquerading as a woman of ill repute. Walking along the side of the road, and Judah was tricked by her disguise and went into her tent and spent time with her. And out of that encounter, she conceived twins, 
twins and uh, Perez and Zara, and these two twins that she bore to her father-in-law, who was unwittingly, uh, you know, involved in this uh, relationship between two persons that were too closely related to have a legitimate union. Anyway, Perez and Zara were her sons, and, uh, and Judah's sons, and m- the vast majority of the tribe of Judah descended from those two Boys, so this statement, we are not born of fornication, that's actually false. The tribe of Judah is half Canaanite through Tamar, the Canaanite daughter in law of their ancestor Judah, and that's the woman from whom the vast majority of them descend. Uh, But Jesus isn't even talking about that natural kind of descent. He says to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came down from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. So this is just part of this very tense argument that's going on between Jesus and the Judeans. The point that the Apostle John is making in recording this is the blindness of sin. Sin blinds even the intellect. To put it bluntly, sin makes you stupid. And these people arguing with Jesus are making bad arguments and They're saying ignorant things that aren't actually true if you look at their history and you look at the scriptures. And so they're not understanding the scriptures properly. They're not understanding their own history properly. And that's not just true of them. That's true of us. This is how we act and we think when we commit sin. It really clouds our minds and makes us uh, ridiculous figures, darkly humorous figures. So as we reach the end of Lent. Let's double down on our Lenten practices. Let's make use of the sacrament of reconciliation and let's be free of sin, which makes us frankly stupid. This has been Dr. John Bergsma from the Franciscan University of Steubenville and the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology wishing you a happy and holy Lent.